Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on COVID-19 and how to prepare as a person living with diabetes. We know it's quite a difficult time for everyone around the world. Everyone in every country is currently focused on implementing different measures to limit the spread of the coronavirus, particularly for those individuals that are at high risk. At Gluco, we're working actively to support our community of people with diabetes and their healthcare teams. We would like to thank you all for everything you've been doing to support this pandemic. I'm Robin Beadle, Director of Marketing here at Gluco, and I wanna thank you for joining us from around the world. We want to ensure that we're providing timely and important information for people with diabetes. I'm joined here by my colleague and lead endocrinologist here in the United States, Dr. Mark Clements. Dr. Clements is a diabetes data and analytics expert who has broad experience in patient care and clinical research. He is a practicing physician at Children's Mercy in Kansas City and also serves as the chief medical officer here at Gluco. I wanna thank him for all of his hard work as a healthcare professional during this crisis and for taking the time out to provide this valuable information for the community. So without further ado, I'll pass it to Dr. Clements. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everybody. And uh, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Uh, I know these are difficult times, uh, but we're going to uh, talk today about uh, children and adults with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So uh, the scope should cover uh, all ages and all groups. We will begin by talking about the objectives I have for today. So uh, the first question I'd like to answer is what should persons with diabetes know about COVID-19 and diabetes? The second uh, is that I'd like to discuss sick day management during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to answer the question, how are healthcare providers adapting their diabetes care during the COVID-19 outbreak? And I'd like to review reliable sources of information about COVID-19. And at Gluco, we would like to answer all of your questions. So what should you know? Persons with diabetes do not appear to be infected at higher rates according to the best available data so far. Persons with diabetes do appear to have a higher risk of serious complications from infection, although the evidence on this is still emerging. Health officials are worried about this virus in particular because it is easily passed from person to person. It has a much higher chance of causing serious harm than influenza, especially among adults greater than 60 years old and potentially among infants. And younger people typically have milder disease but they can still dramatically promote its spread. So what should you do during the pandemic? You should take this opportunity first to get any vaccines that you are missing. Remember that influenza is still circulating in communities and you must protect yourself. Wash your hands after touching any communal surface and before eating. Don't touch your face because that is uh, known to be a way that uh, viruses are uh, passed from person to person. And engage in social distancing. You should remain six feet or two meters away if you absolutely must be in public places. But I would eliminate your presence in public places wherever possible. If you have a fever or cough, stay home. Don't go to see your clinician unannounced for a cough or fever alone. You should call first. Many clinicians and practices have protocols in place during the pandemic. Definitely go to see a clinician if you have shortness of breath, uncontrolled low blood sugars, or persistently high ketones despite your efforts to treat them at home. So how should you wash your hands? The best evidence suggests that we should wash our hands for 25 to 30 seconds. We should cover the palms, the backs of our hands, between our fingers and around our thumbs with soapy water for visibly soiled hands. And we should do the same with hand sanitizer for unsoiled hands. Unsoiled hands can also be cleaned with soap and water. You should wash your hands after touching any commonly touched surface. So think about those surfaces in your environment. These can include credit card readers at the store, door handles, and other surfaces. You should also wash your hands before eating, each and every time. How can you prepare for COVID-19 
with regard to your diabetes? Well, first, you should think about your supplies. This is not a time to wait until the last moment to have your prescriptions refilled. So you should make sure that you have an adequate supply of all your prescriptions, including glucagon and injectable insulin, if you are on those medications. You should also have injectable insulin available, even if you are using a pump, in case of pump malfunction and the need to switch to insulin injections. You should have access to plenty of drinkable liquids with salt replacement. This can include items like chicken soup, homemade lemonade with salt and sugar, clear broths, or drinks with electrolytes. Water will also suffice if these are not available. You should have adequate pump, glucose meter, glucose test strip, and continuous glucose monitor supplies if you're using any of these therapies. You wouldn't want to run out of supplies during a pandemic like this. You should have adequate ketone testing supplies, whether you monitor ketones by urine or blood. You should have an adequate store of fast-acting snacks or glucose tablets. You should contact uh, your providers as needed, and you should keep your provider's contact information readily available. You should have a plan for sharing information about your diabetes with your providers. This includes data from your insulin pump, your glucose meter, and your continuous glucose monitor if you are using any of those modalities. And you should know the 24-hour helpline for your diabetes care provider. Most diabetes clinics have a service to provide 24-hour help. Why should you have a special plan for sick days? Hormones that are released to help fight the illness can also raise your blood sugar levels and make your body resistant to the effects of the insulin you take. Sick days place you at risk for the buildup of ketones and ketoacidosis. And in some cases, sick days can even increase your risk for low blood sugar levels. So what are ketones, and what is ketoacidosis? Ketones are made by breaking down fatty acids in the liver. This happens when insulin levels are too low. Ketones can be used by some organs as an alternate source of energy, but they are acids, and they overwhelm your blood's buffering system. They can give you what we call acidosis. Your body, cells, and your many organs do not function well in acidosis. The symptoms of ketoacidosis include decreased consciousness or lethargy, difficulty breathing, dry skin and dry mouth, a flushed face, a fruity odor to the breath, confusion, nausea and vomiting, or stomach pain. Ketoacidosis can lead to severe illness or even death, so it must be treated immediately. Have someone take you to the emergency room or call 911 in the USA or 112 in Europe or your local emergency contact number if you experience the symptoms with a star next to them above. The purpose of sick day management is to prevent or treat the high ketone levels that cause ketoacidosis or to prevent or treat low blood sugar levels. We have guidance from the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes on sick day management for children and adolescents who take insulin. You should know how to contact your diabetes care provider 24-7. You should brush up on your personal sick day management guidelines from your diabetes team. You should never stop insulin completely without talking to your provider first. And if a child or teen is vomiting, you should assume it is ketoacidosis until proven otherwise. Further recommendations from this pad include the following. One must remember that many illnesses require people to take more Ill insulin. The body's stress response to insulin makes you resistant to the effects of insulin. The exception to this is gastrointestinal illnesses with vomiting. In these cases, less insulin may be needed because blood sugar levels may go low. 
You should check blood sugar levels frequently when you are ill, every two to four hours or every one to two hours if you have high ketones. If ketones are high, you should check ketones at least every four hours. You should also hydrate. Remember to keep plenty of fluids at your disposal. And you should know your total daily dose of insulin. This is the dose of insulin that includes all of your meal boluses, all of your basal insulin, and any insulin you take for corrections. Your diabetes care team should teach you how to use that number to calculate your personal dose of insulin for high ketones with a high blood sugar level. And if you are on one of several therapies, including insulin pumps or certain medicines like SGLT inhibitors, you must treat ketoacidosis and sick days very carefully. With an insulin pump, you must remember that you might have a pump malfunction that's preventing you from getting insulin, hence the need to keep injectable insulin in stock. Secondly, certain medicines like SGLT inhibitors can mask the signs of ketoacidosis. So it's very important to tell any physicians that you are on these medicines. There's also sick day management for those who have type 2 diabetes, especially those not taking insulin. A sick day management plan should still be tailored to you, and you should start it when the first signs of illness occur. You should never stop taking insulin or your glucose-lowering medicines unless otherwise advised by your diabetes care team. Assistance from your clinician or your diabetes team should be sought during illness. Prompt medical assistance may be required to help you adjust any oral medicines or injectable diabetes medicines. As many people with insulin-treated type 2 diabetes are prescribed basal or premixed insulin, they may not have access to rapid-acting insulin to use as supplemental insulin. So you must seek medical assistance in the early stages of insulin in these cases to facilitate appropriate insulin access. People with type 2 diabetes should also monitor glucose more frequently during illnesses. The presence of other severe conditions or end-stage organ failure requires prompt medical attention regardless of your blood glucose levels. People with decreased kidney function are usually advised to stop metformin if the illness is causing dehydration, but speak to your clinician for directions. Ketoacidosis is considered uncommon in individuals with type 2 diabetes, but it may occur in people with type 2 diabetes who are lean, who are pregnant, or who are known to have previously shown ketones. This guidance applies to everyone, regardless of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. During sick days, you should stay hydrated. Keep water available. You can drink one cup or 2.4 deciliters of broth with reduced sodium. If your blood glucose is low, you could eat one double stick popsicle or a half cup or 1.2 deciliters of fruit juice or regular soda, one cup or 2.4 deciliters of a sports drink, one half cup or 1.2 deciliters of lemonade. Keep in mind that gastroenteritis is a special case for sick days. Gastroenteritis often causes low blood sugar levels and can be associated with vomiting and diarrhea. Each of these cases cause you, causes you to not absorb carbohydrates well. So during sick days, after you treat a low blood glucose, you should continue to eat carbohydrates regularly. One recommendation is to eat 50 grams of carbohydrate every four hours. You can see here a list of potential sources of carbohydrate to consume during sick days. You should also know about the rule of 15. This rule applies to everyone, regardless of the type of diabetes. After checking your blood sugar level with your meter, and seeing that your level is under 70 milligrams per deciliter or 3.9 millimoles per liter, 
you should eat 15 grams of simple sugar, wait about 15 minutes, then recheck your blood sugar level. You should repeat this until your blood sugar level is above 70 milligrams per deciliter or above 3.9 millivolts per liter. After you achieve a level above 70 milligrams per deciliter or 3.9 millimoles per liter, you should then eat a complex snack with carbohydrates. Remember, simple sugars include things like glucose tablets, cake gel, Skittles, juice, or soda, while complex snacks may include carbohydrate plus protein or fat. When should you go to the emergency room? You should go to the emergency room or the urgent care upon the guidance of your diabetes care team. Generally speaking, you should go when your efforts to control high ketone levels, vomiting, low blood sugar levels, or other concerning symptoms have failed. Now I'm going to review the five principles of sick day management. If you remember anything, remember these five things. Know your sick day guidelines to reduce your risk for diabetic ketoacidosis and for severe low blood sugar levels with gastrointestinal illnesses. You should monitor blood sugar and ketone levels more frequently during illness. Do not stop insulin without talking to your clinician. Monitor and maintain hydration with adequate salt and water balance. And make sure that you consult a physician or healthcare provider to treat any underlying illnesses. These are some good reads about managing insulin in sick days if you're treated with insulin. I next want to turn my attention to how clinicians and diabetes care teams are adapting to this unusual time during the pandemic. Many centers are considering direct-to-home telehealth as a viable solution to provide quality care during this time. Direct-to-home telehealth can include either a phone call or a video visit using a mobile or computer application. Regulations governing telehealth differ by country and region, but the regulations are also changing dynamically during the COVID-19 pandemic. In the United States, for instance, Medicare started paying for an expanded range of telehealth services starting on March 6th. Recently, the French health minister issued a decree making telehealth easier for providers. The Australian prime minister has also announced access to a telehealth service. And NHS England has allowed remote consultations for those who may have COVID-19. If your provider makes telehealth visits available for you, you should be prepared. Read the instructions on how to connect with any mobile applications to facilitate the, the telehealth visit. If possible, upload your device data to the platform you use at home. If you've never uploaded your device data before, consider contacting your diabetes team for instructions. These are some reliable sources of information on COVID-19. I cannot stress the importance of reviewing only reliable sources of information about this virus. The information that is available on the internet is of variable quality, so one wants to make sure you're using an evidence-based resource to answer your questions. I've listed a few sites here at Gluco, we're also interested in understanding, understanding which sites you are following. If you have any comments or questions, please reach out. I'm going to hand it back to Robin. Thank you, Dr. Clements. We all appreciate you taking the time to go over this material on how best to prepare a person living with diabetes during the COVID-19 pandemic. To those that were able to join us today, thank you so much for viewing. We would love to on today's session, so feel free to drop us a note in the video comments or email us at ask at If you're interested in learning more, visit our COVID-19 Resource Center, which you can access at gluco.com forward slash COVID-19. Thank you again, and asking you all to stay safe, healthy, and happy. We are better together, and we will get through this together. Thank you.